Shalom and welcome to Zola Levitt Presents. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss, and we want to welcome you back to our series in the life of Abraham. I know it's so exciting to see how this life of faith gets played out for us because it's very similar to ours. There's a historical, a prophetic, and a personal meaning that we can draw out of the life of Abraham. Well, it's very personal for them now. I mean, right. they've waited almost two decades right. from the first promise in Genesis 12 right. to now God is coming to them, right. the two angels and the Lord himself. Yes. He's reconfirming the covenant promise that he'd have, that yes. she would be the one that would have the son. Right. And it would be between one man and one woman. That's and God right. is saying, no, this is my plan, right. no extras. Right. And so uh, Sarah, you know, it's God's appointed time, not yes. not our time. Yes. And it's, it's sometimes that's difficult. There's a discrepancy sometimes between what God promises and so. the timing he has and what we try to make happen in that instance. You know, the scripture tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. And we're about to see that here in Genesis yeah. 18 and 19. Let's go to our drama as we see Abraham and Sarah receive their visitors in the heat of the day. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham in the plains of Mamre. שלי לרענן אתכם ולהביא לכם אוכל ומים. שבו בבקשה. איפה שרה אשתך? היא באורן. בעוד שנה יהיה לכם בן. שיחקי שרה, כי האושר יהיה גורלו של בנך. הוא יביא אושר לעולם. אבל אושרו יגיע מאמונה ומסבל. לעת עתה שיחקי. When you come to Israel, you'll experience that very hospitality that we see Abraham exemplifying with these strangers that come. Three men appear, men appear. What we really are seeing are two angels and a theophany, the presence of the Lord himself at the front of Abraham's tent. And we know this is a theophany. He's different from the other two. The other two will be going on to Sodom to take care of some kind of business there. But this one stays with Abraham. And he, uh, Abraham rushes to create a covenant meal with them. That's a very important part of the story of covenant. There's always a shared time of food. There's always a shared time of hospitality. It reminds me of, of Jesus making the Last Supper with his disciples or preparing fish for, for the fishermen on the shore after his resurrection. There's a way that there's something around the breaking of bread that brings us together and ratifies or touches the reality of covenant. And that's what we see here with this appearance of the Lord and the two angels. It's interesting that this center man, this one, appears between the two angels or comes with two angels. And scripture tells us about God that he dwells between the two cherubim. And that's what we see here, is Abraham is encountering these angels and the Lord himself in the midst of the pain of circumcision, in the midst of this incredible harsh environment he has given to hospitality, which is a heartbeat of the culture here. The visitors inquire about Sarah's presence, where she is, she's in the tent. And the, the Lord himself says that she will bear a child and it makes her laugh. It drives them just over the edge to think that they, being past the age of childbearing, are going to bear a child. And he says within a year, he'll return and there will be a child. 
for them. And the laughter becomes the name of this promised son, Yitzchak, laughter. And I think here is one of the most important takeaways from this section of the story. The word comes, is anything too hard for the Lord? And I want you to hear that word today. I want you to apply that to your own life. I want to apply it to my own. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He is the God of miracles. He's the God of second chances. He's the God of the promise. And that's what the word is that comes to them here. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That which is impossible with man is possible with God. And so as this story unfolds, we really begin to see that when God makes a covenant, He fulfills His word. You know, there's such a difference between who Abraham was before the covenant cutting and the circumcision and who he is after. Before, he was trying to make things happen in the natural with no possible good effect. But afterwards, he becomes one who is dependent on the glory of God, the miracle working power of God, and the blessing of God. And we see that unfolding. And I want you also to grab hold of that today, that God is for you. There is nothing that is too hard for our God. For insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levant Letter. When you call, be sure to ask for our free catalog with the latest videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies includes reading packets, teaching CDs, and mail-in tests. You may want to join us on an upcoming tour of Israel or Petra, or cruise the Mediterranean visiting Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. They had good reason to laugh. Both Abraham and Sarah had been informed by the Lord that they were going to give birth to a son, even in their later years. But the Lord's message for Sodom was anything but good. אברהם, אם היה עשרה צדיקים בסדום, אחוס על היום. We are in the area of the Dead Sea where Sodom and Gomorrah no doubt were existing at the time of Abraham. You know, the judgments of God are really difficult to understand and we like to think of God as loving only and that he wouldn't judge. The good news is that when the judgments of God comes, he makes a provision, a way of escape that's pictured in this story. Abraham is going to be seen now in his role as an intercessor. Very important instruction for us as New Testament believers because the role of intercession is really about relationship with God. In fact, the way God speaks of it in verse 17, He says, Ba'adonai amar hamechase ani me'avraham asher aniyoseh. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? They are so close, they are so known one of another that God's testimony of Abraham, his friend, is I won't even hide from him that which I'm doing. I want to walk with God in that way. So what we're seeing develop here is this relationship where the, what's unfolding is the reality that God can trust Abraham and Abraham can trust God. It's a genuine relationship. It reminds me of John 15 in the New Testament where Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Why? When? When you do that which I command you. I want to walk with the Lord in such a way that he can call me his friend. Well, the role of intercession is very, very powerful. It's very important. It really is for every single believer in the New Testament era. We really need to understand that we can affect 
the way the world unfolds, we can affect the history and the destiny of people through our prayer. It's God's gift to us, intercession. It's really a power that's given to us by God. It's a, a, a way that He esteems our opinion. He includes us in the process of what He does. And we learn from intercession, from prayer, that He actually hears us. And that's what we see with Abraham. Abraham actually begins to bargain with God about the future of Sodom and Gomorrah. If there are 50 righteous, will you spare them? And he works his way down to 10. If there are 10 righteous, would you spare them? You know, the rabbis say that that's the basis of the modern 10-man minion. The reason why there's a 10-man requirement in Judaism for a prayer meeting is because of this process of the 10 righteous that are being looked for by Abraham and God together. You know, we know for us as believers in Yeshua, wherever two or more are gathered in His name, He's there. But that 10-man minion is still a tradition in present-day Judaism based on this story from Sodom and Gomorrah. This is really a story of relationship, and we see this over and over again as Abraham is talking to God, God is talking to him, and they're speaking face to face, friend to friend. It's, it's like the intercessors in the Old Testament, Moses standing in for Israel, Elijah interceding for the nation of Israel, and now for you and I, we are all to stand in for our friends, for our families, and I would say for the nation of Israel. I want to call on you to stand with me as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as we stand in in intercession for the future of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Israel. It's the land of covenants. It's the land of promise. It's the holy land. Yes. And we love to host you on a tour that's coming up with us. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 84, blessed are they whose hearts are set on making pilgrimage. Right. There's a special blessing as you set your heart to go to Israel. God really does something amazing. It's true. I, I hear that feedback all the time from our guests. And every time we go, there's something new from the Word. There's a new experience with the Lord. Uh, it never gets old. So it's great to be able to host people there. And we have the best guides. We have the greatest facilities. It's just a wonderful, wonderful tour. Uh, you can find out about our tours at 1-800-WONDERS, or you can see us at levitt.com. You can also learn about the tours and many other things through our Levitt letter. It's a great news magazine. It's free to you. We'd love to send it to you. And this week, our offer is a great DVD series that Zola made called The Sons of Israel. It's really a look at some of the key Bible figures throughout Scripture and the impact that they've had on history and really on our lives as we learn from them. Uh, you know, as the story of Abraham unfolds, it's just so uh, amazing that we get to partake of his, his walk of faith and really see how the ups and downs, uh, even though they affect man, and woman, yeah. uh, God always comes through. Well, Abraham was set apart so he could step in, so yeah. he could be that intercessor, intercessor right. to intercede for Lot and yeah. his family, and, and God rescued Lot and his family, right. those and God, that were willing. God calls him a patriarch, calls him a prophet, and then calls Abraham my friend. Right. And he speaks to him about how he's going to tell him beforehand right. these things that are coming. And he really does try to rescue Lot and his family. He makes the provision. Right. Right. And and we're about to see how that plays out, but God always makes the provision. We really see that in these verses, in this drama. So let's return to our story as we see Lot and his family dealing with the judgment coming on Sodom. And there came two angels to Sodom and said unto Lot, Hast thou family here in Sodom? If so, take them from the city, for the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot warned his sons-in-law of the pending destruction, but they wouldn't listen. I'm 
חשבו שאני לועג להם, אני כל כך מצטער, ניסיתי. בנות, אל תביטו לאחור, אנחנו בטוחים בצוהר. אני חולם. אתם זוכרים את שתי האנשים הטובים שהיו אצלנו אתמול בבית? ואת הטירוף מהאנשים בדלת? אל תסתכלי לאחור, הזהירו אותנו, שלא נסתכל לאחור. ואשר לסדום, קדימה. God has warned Abraham and Lot about the impending judgment. You know, he warned Noah. He warns us about judgment to come. I think about New Testament believers that, that we've been warned, that we need to be looking for that blessed hope right. because when judgment comes in the earth, we can be taken up by a rapture before the judgment comes. Well, and God works with Abraham as he does with a friend. In the intercession, the angel actually went and grabbed hold of Lot and his wife. There was even a halting at that moment. And it says the angel of the Lord that caused him to move forward. Yes. And Lot's wife must have had something in her heart that was not able to rise up and go like Sarah was with, with Abraham yes. because she got part way out and even though destruction was coming, she looked back. She did and there was a warning not to look back. You know, people question the science of this thing, but I remember growing up right. and seeing National Geographic spread about the, the destruction of Pompeii in Italy in 79 AD, and in an instant, people were frozen in the act of living their lives just as if fire and brimstone had come from heaven, it came out of a volcano, and they were frozen in time. So I believe it's very real, scientifically proven. In fact, uh, Josephus says that he had seen the pillar of salt that was allegedly Lot's wife, somewhere in this area. So it's scientifically possible that this happened the way the scripture tells it. And we don't need to question that because it really is the way God was bringing judgment in that day. You know, really the question that for us is, what are we looking back to? Let's not look back, let's right. go forward go with the forward. Lord. And make our pursuit of him who's pursuing us. Even though Lot had pitched his tent where the world was, where destruction was, you see the mercy of God yes. intervening in yes. his life yes. and his family's life. Yeah. And, you know, Lot, Lot really tr cooperated. The scripture yep. even says in Peter, yes. righteous Lot. Yes. I don't know how that works out, but God does, and he's so merciful. Yeah, it's interesting because the Bible says in judgment, remember mercy. Right. And I think we see that with Peter's testimony about righteous Lot, that God is merciful in the midst of judgment. He wake, makes a way of escape for us as he did for them. Amos 3, 7 says that he will not hide what he is doing from his servants, the prophets. And we're going to find out that Abraham was not only a patriarch, but he was also a prophet. And what we're seeing here in this incredible story of judgment, escape, and the, the amazing drama of this right. is that always God is sovereign. He's always wanting the best for you and for me, and he's always wanting to make a way for us through the times of judgment. Miles, you're teaching about judgment and mm. how science has established that it was actually a reality. It's possible, yeah, the way, way it happened in Italy and then we see it in the scriptures. I know, and yet we see God's mercy always reaching for mankind. And that's really the theme of that part of the story, isn't it? That God was making a way where there seemed to be no way. I'm thinking about today, in today's times, we have such misinformation coming to you through the airwaves and out of the Middle East. And one of our great friends in the ministry is Avi and Rachel Lipkin. Rachel was born in Egypt. She is a, an Egyptian Jew, and she is able to interpret the Arab media for the government of Israel and for you and me. So we get to understand what's being said in Arabic amongst themselves 
versus what's being said for our consumption in the West in English. R Catherine was able to interview her, and so let's go to Catherine's interview with Rachel Lipkin. Rachel, I know that you know Arabic, so you're able to um, decipher what the, what the news is not picking up. Tell us a little bit about what you're hearing. Okay, I am working for the Radio Authority already more than 35 years. And I, uh, my language, my first language is Arabic, like you know, I know English, I know French, and I can understand Spanish too. And for me, I went through so much in this authority radio. In the end, I got to a point that the most important work that I can do is to listen to the Arabs' uh, communication, like radio, TV, cable, everything, and hear about what they say really uh, with their own words. I know that what they are talking to the West are not the same what they are talking to the Arab countries. Uh, this uh, activity of the Muslim brothers are already a long time ago. And uh, we knew that uh, this is not an issue of a very short time. You were in Egypt. Yeah. Your father was thrown in jail yes. for the simple fact of being a Jew. Exactly. Not and only him, but all the Jews were captured, men and boys, but in prisons. And now it's accelerating even beyond such since uh, the, the spring of the, the uprising. Uprising, yes. But uh, you have to understand that this is like first step is to take care of the Jews in Egypt, and now they are taking care of the Christian. Now, you know that the last few months and year, uh, they are against the Christian very openly, and nobody, nobody can take care of them. And we are seeing uh, already uh, a lot of Christian who are flee outside Egypt. Some of them were being killed. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand also that the Christian are the main people of Egypt mm -hmm. and they have a lot of wealth, they have a lot of money and uh, the Muslim to take care of this Christian, they take the money, they take the, the girls, they get married to them mm -hmm. and they pull them like to be a, a baby factory for the Muslims. And like this, uh, the Christian uh, ethnic group who are in Egypt are completely uh, destroyed. What can Americans do to be more educated in this? Uh, it's very difficult, very difficult to people who doesn't understand what is the Muslim uh, uh, religion. And if you go to the Quran and you know exactly what they are talking about, they don't take no Christian and no Jews like a friend. And the more you are an extremist uh, Islamic person, you go through the book. And if you go through the book, you have to get rid of the Jewish and the Christian. And like this, they are doing. They are doing what the Quran is saying. Uh, there is some, some Muslim who are not exactly with the same way with this Islamic. But when you see that Egypt, for example, now have 75% uh, extremist people are in the government, then you can see what Egypt is going. That is such an incredible interview that Catherine did with Rachel. You know, the, the times that we're living in require this kind of insight into what's going on behind the scenes in the Middle East. We can't really get our news from the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. At the time we filmed that, there hadn't yet been the election in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And she was very prescient in the way that she spoke right. about what was coming and what's come to pass, which is, has been an election that's made the Muslim Brotherhood rise to the surface. So what was supposed to be an Arab Spring, as I said, has become an Arab Springboard for the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. And so there's a, a lot of controversy taking place right now about what it will continue to mean. But there have been many voices in Israel and among Messianics and others in the world saying to be careful and be aware that this may not be what it appears to be. The Western media are speaking glowing terms about an Arab democracy, but uh, it doesn't look that way. It looks as though we need to continue to keep our eyes on the Lord, doesn't yeah. it? Hebrews talks about keeping your eyes on the Lord, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Right. And somehow Abraham is making it into the new covenant. And I wanted to bring this out because even in the midst of 
the most wicked circumstance, the Lord was able to deliver Lot. You know, it says in 2 Peter 2, 7, that God delivered righteous Lot right. out of a really hard circumstance. So he can take our lives and deliver us in the most difficult circumstance. Right. Miles, that we are living in really times that are perplexing. They are. There's perplexity of nations. Right. Seems to be no way out right. for many people. There's pressure that's right. coming economically and emotionally, spiritually, and people are looking here and there for answers and for solutions. And we know that the writer of Hebrews was in fact correct, looking unto Jesus, the author mm -hmm. and finisher of our faith. That is where our solution comes Hebrew from. Hebrews is the book that we go to, to any of the questions that we have on Genesis, we go to right. the book of Hebrews and he answers them all, right? right? They're interpreted through a, a Jewish perspective. Right. And so we get to see the confluence between the Old Testament and the New Testament because they're perfectly connected. Mm -hmm. And so as we go today, we want to remind you, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, Sons of Israel. Three DVDs featuring the teaching of Zola Levin on location in Israel. This nine-part series chronicles the fascinating lives of some of God's key men. From Abraham, Moses, and David to the Messiah and the Apostles an informative and stunningly beautiful history of the people God chose and the special men among them that He used for His purposes. A nine-part series on three DVDs, Sons of Israel. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com, along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule, and much more. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.